Thanks to Brilliant for supporting my channel. Over the past few years, several machine learning models have started to emerge as powerhouses within the field, things like GPT-3 or BERT to name a few. And because these are models that are also being deployed to the public fairly frequently, researchers at Stanford decided to create essentially a center to better understand the strengths and potential harms of these models, calling them in their new paper foundation models. Of course, that paper is over 200 pages long, so in the event that you don't want to read that entire thing, I thought that I would summarize the key highlights in another episode of my series called Journal Club, where we go over interesting papers and books in AI and emerging tech. If you're new here, I'm Jordan. Consider subscribing if you want to see more videos like this. And if you'd like to have more discussions like this offline, I actually have a newsletter where I talk about AI, emerging tech, mindful productivity, ADHD, mental health, and anything else that happens to be on my mind, which you can subscribe to in the description. All right, so there was a lot of discussion about this paper on AI Twitter when it came out a couple months ago. And one of the big questions that came up initially was what exactly a foundation model is. According to the paper, a foundation model is any model that is trained on broad data at scale and can be adapted or fine-tuned to a wide range of downstream tasks. Current examples include BERT, GPT-3, and CLIP. On a technical level, foundation models are enabled by transfer learning and scale. Transfer learning is what makes foundation models possible, but scale is what makes them powerful. In other words, foundation models are large pre-trained models that can be used as a foundation for more specific applications via methods like fine tuning and transfer learning. And unlike models that are smaller or that are trained on more niche data sets, their power comes in part from the fact that they are large enough to be trained on these very, very large data sets and develop an encoding for the complex relationships between the general range of topics within those data sets. One of the interesting things that the authors, of which there are like 50 or 100, there's a lot of people in this paper, point out early on is that most of the models that they consider foundation models are actually developed by large tech companies, places like Google and OpenAI. And from an ethics perspective, this can be a bit of a cause for concern because it means that access to that model is essentially determined by the company that controls it. And in this case, those companies have financial interest in how they allow other people to access them. On top of that, the scale of most of these models makes them near impossible to train on any standard machine learning computer in any reasonable amount of time. So researchers who are interested in understanding how the model works by taking it apart don't actually have access to the model itself. And instead, can only do so through essentially prompting an API. And we'll get into some criticism around the term foundation models later on in the video, but for now, let's make sure we're all on the same page about what this paper is talking about. According to this paper, foundation models are significant for two reasons, emergence and homogenization. Emergence refers to the phenomena where the behavior of a model is implicitly induced rather than explicitly encoded. And this is said to be both a source of scientific excitement because we have these models that are more powerful that we may have initially realized, but also considerable concern because when things go wrong, we don't necessarily know why. On the other hand, homogenization is the consolidation of the models that we use for a wide range of applications, which is good in that we found that we can adapt the same model architecture towards a wide variety of tasks, but is bad in that there's essentially one point of failure. So if there's anything wrong with that model architecture, its use is already pretty widespread. Transformer-based models, things like GPT-3 and CLIP, are probably the easiest example of both emergent and homogenization. They implicitly learn from large data sets and can be applied towards a large range of tasks, which makes them very powerful, and their potential for widespread public use makes them a pretty common failure mode. One of the other questions that comes up in discussions of this paper is the name itself. Why are we calling these models foundation models? In fact, there's actually a bit of a debate about this over on AI Twitter, where people felt that the term foundation implied that these models are foundational to the field of machine learning, which isn't accurate and leaves out a lot of other work in the field. The Others state that they chose foundation because these models have the potential to serve as the unfinished base for future applications, similar to the foundation of a structure. And I think this makes sense, but I can also see arguments for other terms. I think that when I read this paper the first time, the term base model seemed like it would make more sense. In fact, universal model was apparently the name that they were originally going to go with before they ended up changing it before they went public with this paper. So there are a lot of different terms that you could use to describe these types of models. In fact, the term that we used before this paper came out was large pre-trained models. There already was a term. So I think that anyone could argue with any term that you come up with. 
Now, the rest of this paper focuses on a bunch of different subdomains of foundation models and essentially acts as a literature review for this entire field, so I'm not actually going to go too deep into that. If you're interested in a particular topic in this list, I would actually recommend just reading that section. They serve as standalone written pieces, so you don't really need to read the entire thing to understand one 10-page section. What I do want to briefly talk about, though, is some of the criticisms of the idea of foundation models. One of them is something that we've already talked about, which is the fact that foundation models is kind of an odd term for something that we already had a name for. We have pre-trained large models. Additionally, the examples that they provide in this paper are fairly limited, as I mentioned, to models that are trained by major tech companies, whereas there are other models that I would consider that fall under their definition of foundation models, things like ResNet 50 that are used everywhere and have been trained on massive data sets, which they don't really discuss at all. In fairness to them, they mention in the paper that they're not able to essentially cover the entire field because there's so many models that are being developed and used that would likely fall under their rubric of foundation models, but it does seem a little bit odd that the ones that they tend to focus on are more industry focused versus being academic focused, which lines up with some of the criticisms that people have of this paper that it feels more like a grant application. Another thing is that foundation models are supposed to be these large models, but they don't really talk about scale, so it's unclear what the cutoff for a foundation model is in their heads. I think that specifying that is helpful because it tells you a lot about what kinds of models we might be looking at and what already exists in the field that might be looked at. And it also tells us what we might not be looking at. So smaller models, more niche models, things that actually smaller companies who can't necessarily afford to run things like GPT-3 might use in place of these larger language models that might have their own faults that we don't know a ton about. In short, while I think that it's true that large pre-trained models should be studied to better understand their strengths and harms, especially since a lot of these models have been used in public-facing machine learning systems for a while now, I do find the term foundation models to be a little bit arbitrary, considering that we've already had a name for these models and that there has been ongoing research about them. On the other hand, this paper seems to be a way of introducing the Center for Research on Foundational Models over at Stanford to the larger machine learning community, and I do think that it's probably a good idea to have a center that focuses on looking at how these models work and trying to get a better understanding of that, especially if they end up expanding the scope of the models that they end up looking at. After all, there's a ton of opportunities to investigate these types of models, especially under the very, very broad definition that they give in this paper. And given the widespread use of these models, they're likely to have impact on how we continue to use machine learning in the future. But regardless of how you want to approach your interest in foundation models, you'll need a solid foundation in scientific thinking to get started, and Brilliant's newly updated course on scientific thinking is a great place to start. It's full of interactive exercises that let you experience the principles of science firsthand. If you've heard me talk about Brilliant before, then you know that it is a website and app based on the principle of active problem solving. After all, to really learn something, it's not enough to just watch someone else do it, you have to actually do it yourself. And as someone who personally learns better through visual and physical intuition than through rote memorization, I really appreciate Brilliant's interactive approach to teaching the major pillars of STEM. So if you're interested in spending more time on the programming side of foundation models, Brilliant can help you learn how to program without having to dig through the weeds of coding syntax through these fun interactive challenges. In their Python programming course, you just shift around these blocks of pseudocode and then you can get immediate feedback on your results. It's a good way to understand how computer algorithms work, and then once you have that down, the coding syntax becomes a lot less intimidating. On Brilliant, it's not about memorizing or regurgitating facts for a test. You can just pick a course you're interested in and get started. Feeling stuck or made a mistake? You can read the explanations to find out more and learn at your own pace. So if you'd like to try out Brilliant for free and get 20% off a year of STEM learning, you can click on the link right here, or you can go to brilliant.org slash Jordan to sign up for free. You can also check out past journal clubs up here. You can follow me on all of my various socials down here. And otherwise, I will see y'all next Monday. Bye.